Hi, I'm Mike Cohn, and this is our fifth podcast for Tap Into Westfield. Today we have David Rowe. David, hi, welcome to the show. Hello, Mike. It is great to see you, and I have to say, great to see you again. Uh, what a delightful surprise when you knocked on the door. <laughs> Um, I opened the door and uh, we, um, unbeknownst to both of us, of course, knew each other in, um, due to very, very different circumstances. Um, I remember it was this last summer, probably actually the last two summers, um, we would gather with our children uh, at Tamakwa's Park on the tennis courts and uh, as the passionate fathers <laughs> living vicariously through our children's tennis, we would be drilling uh, our kids at unearthly hours of the night um, uh, and, uh, and we would see each other on respective courts and um, so we recognize each other's faces we chatted once in a while and uh, bingo here you are uh, today uh, interviewing me or chatting about um, something very very different it's a, it's a delight to be here Mike. Oh thank you and could you tell us what you do your role in Westfield as part of uh, your profession? Sure so I am the music director of the New Jersey Festival Orchestra. The New Jersey Festival Orchestra is an orchestra that has been in existence mm, a good 35 years now. It was originally called the Westfield Symphony and four years ago there was a grand amalgamation of two or three other professional orchestras and um, we reorganized um, the orchestra to become a much bigger regional professional orchestra now called the New Jersey Festival Orchestra, again of which I am the music director. Um, and I've been the music director a good 16 years uh, and I've been living in this area um, for that many years. Uh, I first came to the area to live in Springfield to take, I came to the area to take this job and originally lived in Springfield, the next town over and um, uh, bit the bullet six years ago <laughs> and joined this fantastic community of Westfield and now live here on the north side on Prospect Street. And it was one of the best decisions I've ever made in my life. And how does a town this size have an orchestra such as this? How is that I, possible? Yeah, I know, it's, it's incredible, Mike. Um, I am unaware um, of a town this size anywhere else in the country which um, houses, uh, supports, and, uh, and nurtures uh, a professional symphony orchestra. Uh, it's an extraordinary phenomenon. And that speaks to the commitment of the people from this town um, to their community, because it is community. It's regionally supported now, but it is a, a sizable portion of the support comes from Westfield. So uh, that shows how much Westfielders care about the health of their community. I say the health because of course a symphony orchestra and indeed a professional symphony orchestra and might I say the second largest professional symphony orchestra in the state um, is a fantastic uh, manifestation and barometer of the health of a town. Um, it shows that uh, its community cares about its cultural environment, its educational environment. An orchestra also serves as a wonderful ambassador for our community um, throughout the state. Um, everyone knows that the uh, New Jersey Festival Orchestra uh, is, is its primary home is Westfield and so wherever we go we carry the banner, the flag if you like, of Westfield and we go all over the state and we perform in New York City on occasion, Carnegie Hall, um, Lincoln Center, and we are very proud to serve uh, uh, that ambassadorial role for this um, treasured community. Where do you perform here in Westfield? Mm. So um, we have two uh, primary homes, uh, one in, here in Westfield in, in Union County and the other in um, Drew University in, in, in uh, Morris County. Uh, we are also the um, house orchestra for the Mayo Performing Arts Centre. So for example, when acts come in, such as uh, the Three Irish Tenors, or Mannheim Steamrollers, or um, uh, um, God rest his soul, uh, Don Rickles came oh. in last year. We, oh, were wow. his, we were his backup orchestra. Oh. Um, 
Where, um, where was Don Rickles? Don Rickles was at the um, Mayo Performing Arts Center in, in Morristown. Wow, uh, Don, Don Rickles is my grandfather's <laughs> favorite performer. I know, he, 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 he was <laughs> magnificent. He was, I think he was 91 uh, last year. Uh, as we all know, he passed away recently. But he, he struggled to get on stage, but once he was on stage, he just came completely alive. 20, 30 years just <laughs> fell off his shoulders. And he was uh, uh, feisty and energetic as we all know Don Rickles can be. So he went first and then you went, or you so, went first? Um, we went first, we warmed up the, or oh, okay. the, the audience, we then played, it, played, uh, um, played him on stage. <laughs> We interacted a little with him, and then we played him off, and we played some more. So we were like the um, Tonight Show band, if you like, kind of um, enhancing uh, the main act. Um, so we play various roles, um, but to specifically answer your question, where do we play in Westfield? Our, um, our primary venue um, is the Presbyterian Church uh, on Mountain Avenue. Um, this is a magnificent space for anyone who's not been in it. It uh, seats about 800 people. It's a gorgeous church, a colonial style church, and we have had a long, long relationship with them. In fact, we have been playing there since our inauguration, uh, over, uh, our, since our formation over 35 years ago. Um, so, uh, and what we do, we come into that space and we completely reshape it to, to basically turn it into a theater. We import a massive um, 40 by 40 foot um, stage. Uh, we put up theatrical lights. Um, we take over the hall, uh, the, the sanctuary for the day and turn it into a, a magnificent performing space. Is that the upstairs um, area in that church? Um, it's the whole sanctuary. Oh, it's right. the whole building, which has a, a main orchestra floor, oh. and it also has a balcony. Yes, yes. Um, oh, and, you know, depending on the program, we can fill that place. Uh, oh. Our most popular program is the Home for the Holidays concert, always in the first two weeks of December, um, which is holiday, fair, Christmas fair, um, family uh, style uh, symphonic presentation, um, where we play movie music, we play, um, uh, you know, sounds of the season. And we fill that place with over 800 people um, there every year. And that's of, of often um, a, 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 an opportunity for us to collaborate with other elements of the community, such as we always use, collaborate with uh, one or two of the um, elementary schools. So uh, a 50 piece uh, kids choir makes a cameo appearance for one oh. of the, the presentations either Franklin or Wilson or someone on, some on the south side we, we try and share it um, so the kids are involved the high school's been involved in the past um, so but we do all our concerts when we perform in Westfield at the Presbyterian Church and we, again we, we we transform that place into a, a magnificent theatre and when is the next performance? Mm. The next performance is the weekend of May the 20th, 21st, or Saturday and Sunday, I believe it is, or May the 21st, 22nd, that weekend anyway, whereby um, it's, a, it's a classical symphonic concert, um, whereby and we perform two major works, one by Tchaikovsky called the um, Rococo Variations, and it's a piece for solo cello and symphony orchestra. It's like a concerto, if you like. And we have highlighted uh, a Jersey girl done good. Uh, there is a magnificent um, Chinese American cellist who, stu who was born in New Jersey. Her parents live out in Bernardsville area. In fact, her parents are professional musicians and, and her father makes musical instruments, makes violins and cello and, and, and uh, string instruments. However, um, Sophie, uh, Balakla is her name, um, um, studied at the Juilliard School of Music uh, and um, committed herself to music and then um, traveled to Europe and is making a fantastic career for herself in Germany. Um, 
I heard about her through an agent that I work with in, in Europe, funnily enough, and uh, after digging around a little, discovered that in fact she was from New Jersey. Um, so the combination of a world-class instrumentalist who was, you know, born in our backyard was an irresistible uh, combination to have her perform with us. So she is the highlighted soloist uh, in the Tchaikovsky Rococo Variations. Uh, the other major piece is a massive, massive symphony by Gustav Mahler, one of the great 20th century um, uh, symphonic composers. And uh, it's his first symphony called The Titan. Um, and, you know, that that's subtitle uh, implies the, 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 the scope of this piece. It's, it's John Williams on steroids. Um, it's magnificent music. Uh, and the program indeed is called Battle of the Titans, uh, due to the symphonic work called uh, Mahler's Symphony No. 1, The Titan, and the titanic talent of this young cellist who, 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 who heralds from New Jersey. You, you talk with incredible passion and oh, really? excitement <laughs> about your art. Where, where did you get that from? Oh, gee. When, um, when, did, when did it all begin, your, your love of, of music? Well, look, I am... Um, where, where are you from, I guess, is the first, you know, how did you... Well, okay, well, I'll answer the, the first yeah. question first, and then I'll get to yeah. that one. I, you know, I am enormously blessed to be working in a field that I adore. I can't imagine doing anything else in my life. Um, I live, drink, eat, breathe music. And whether it's performing, which I, I love and I do both in this country and I travel abroad and do that as well, or whether it be teaching, w working with young kids, um, or whether it be playing a, a, a managerial or ambassador ro ambassadorial role, a visionary role from the company of which I'm music director, it's all part of being in a, an environment which uh, I thrive and I adore. So I get up in the morning and I thank the good Lord that I'm in a, I'm in a business that I love. So the enthusiasm and passion comes from that and it's being renewed every day. To answer your second question, uh, this is not a Texas accent. <laughs> I'm British by birth. Although I'm very uh, a proud holder of an American passport as well, the Brits and the Americans allow dual citizenship. Um, so born in England, um, but prob lived in America as much as I've lived in England. I came over here uh, in my early 20s uh, and I've been in America a good 20 years. Um, so uh, starting out actually in Chicago, studying at Northwestern University. Uh, a magnificent music program there. I did a Masters of, of Music at, at Northwestern. Then went on to do doctoral studies in Kansas City of all places. Wow. Everything's up to date in Kansas City. Um, but, and that's where I really cut my professional teeth in mm -hmm. that while studying there, I founded an orchestra, uh, a professional orchestra. The environment at the time was conducive for an, an entrepreneurial activities such as that because the symphony orchestra just collapsed believe it or not and so there are a lot of quality professional musicians floating around looking for work so I galvanized that talent and um, formed a professional ensemble and that was a fantastic experience because yes it learned it was a, it was a tool for me to practice my art but also I was involved at the managerial level and at the board level and uh, the marketing level and the fundraising level. So I had my fingers in every um, subset of, uh, uh, of the business of an organization. And that was a great education. What, what was the university in, in Kansas City? Called? The University of Missouri in Kansas oh, okay. City, uh, which had a, has a conservatory. And a very fine one at that. I know. I know. I listen to. I've never actually been to Kansas City, but when I listen to baseball games, they always say there's good rib joints in uh, Kansas City. Oh my God, the ribs are fantastic. <laughs> the barbecue sauce is fantastic. The jazz is fantastic. There was a famous um, cross crossroads. Of, I think it's called 18th and Vine, where a number of the famous jazz artists from the 1930s and 40s uh, lived and worked there. Um, so Kansas City has a great tradition of sports, music, jazz, um, barbecue, <laughs> uh, beef. It's a great place. 
So the mid, you were shaped by your mid. You came from Britain, and then you your Midwest. I went roots. straight to mid the Midwest. Yeah, and, and, and that, was there on and off for a good five, four or five years. And that that shaped your uh, your view of the of America. Well, <laughs> that's a good. That's a, a that's a that's a great question. You know, the bumper sticker on the on uh, 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 underneath the na the numbers of a of a Missouri license plate is the it's Missouri the Show Me State. <laughs> And you know, Midwesters, they're very, you know, they're straight shooters, uh, they're good people, uh, they're, they're people with values. Um, and um, I enjoyed that um, um, simplicity of outlook, uh, not simplistic, but uh, straightforward um, uh, um, way of speaking which you know when you get to the coasts or even when you get to England uh, or, or Europe uh, there's a little more kind of uh, indirectness and play and and uh, co you know complication added into life which sometimes is a good thing sometimes not such a good thing so I I very much appreciated living in the Midwest uh, uh, you know it was diametrically opposed to what I'd come from in in Europe um, but I was only there about five years before then I was drawn to the East Coast uh, to uh, and when, where I very luckily was adopted by the Tanglewood Inst uh, Music Institute and spent, which is the most famous uh, 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 summer festival, uh, music festival uh, in, in the country. Uh, and I was a fellow there for a number of years and then through there I became the uh, the assistant conductor of the Boston Symphony Orchestra and the Boston Symphony is a magnificent professional symphony and and um, from there my career launched in various directions took me to Germany took me to this position uh, and it's taken me um, all over Europe and Asia as well now did this is when you performed with the Boston Symphony did you uh, were you um, did you ever go to Nantucket and do that uh, yearly performance in Nantucket. Ah, you know, that's right. Uh, I didn't, actually. Um, I think, correct me if I'm wrong, I think it's the Boston Pops, which oh. is the Boston Symphony yes, Orchestra. Yes. The Boston Symphony and the Boston Pops are the same company. Oh, okay. But I think it's the Boston Pops that goes there. But I might be, I might be wrong, uh, although I believe I'm right. Um, no, I didn't take that journey, unfortunately. I wish I had. Because my duties were uh, uh, up in Tanglewood with the Boston oh. Symphony, which is resident there for two months. But um, I did hear about that, uh, very popular. I did travel on tour with the Boston Symphony uh, throughout Europe, France, Germany, England, um, Prague, I remember going to. Um, and my experiences that were there, and I'm meeting, you know, I was the personal musical assistant of Seiji Ozawa, one of the great conductors of our time. And um, uh, that was an experience in itself. But but just being meeting all sorts of magnificent musicians and conductors that travel through, that was an experience I will I will never forget and set me up for the rest of my career. And when you're, can you tell the, the listeners a little bit of like they may not know exactly what an orchestra is and like how many pieces there are and and what what is mm. what exactly is it all about? Ah, good question, Mike. Um, so. I think most people know what an orchestra is. You know, they're kids if they're in, in school. We have an orchestra at Roosevelt and uh, uh, at, at our elementary schools as well, and of course our high school. In fact, we have a great orchestra. We have a great musical tradition within our school systems here in Westfield. So um, many of our children play in these ensembles. An orchestra is, is, is an ensemble, um, but it is, it's probably the most diverse of all the ensembles because it has both wind instruments, string instruments and percussion instruments, whereas a wind ensemble will only have wind, a percussion ensemble will only have a, a, a percussion. So it's a conglomeration of all the musical forces uh, to form this multicolored, musically speaking, uh, multicolored sound world, uh, which is the most flexible of all the, uh, of all the ensembles. Um, and because of that, um, most there's been more great music written for an orchestra than any other ensemble. Uh, and so the orchestra has become the dominant um, fine arts musical ensemble in our history for the last 
250, 300 years because it's the most dynamic, that it's the most flexible, it's the most varied in, the, in, in, in terms of sound world. Um, it involves, as I say, wind instruments, uh, specifically woodwind instruments, and, the, and the, fa the members within that family are a flute, oboes, clarinets, bassoons. It has another subset family called the brass, and in that family we have horns, trumpets, trombones, tubers. Um, these are instruments which are built of metal and brass. Uh, of course, we have the per percussion section, which has a whole battery, a whole army of different instruments, and they can, from timpani to bass drums to cymbals to xylophones to glockenspiels to I could go on all day listening, uh, listing all the different instruments uh, that make up the uh, percussion, percussion world. And then, of course, the heart or the core of a, an orchestra are the strings. And within that family, we have the violins, we have the violas, we have the celli. And then we have the double basses. Um, so these various families all fit together to form this, on occasion, massive ensemble. So I have conducted orchestras that are over 100 pieces. Uh, a chamber orchestra, the type that I worked with in Kansas City, the orchestra that I founded, it was called the Kansas City Camerata, which I talked about earlier. That was more a chamber orchestra, so kind of commando-like, uh, very uh, uh, dynamic and, and maneuverable force and that had maybe 30 people in it. So anywhere from 20, 30 up to 100. The New Jersey Festival Orchestra again varies depending on what we perform. The performance on May the 21st and 22nd um, is a big, big orchestra. Battle of the Titans, Mahler, Massive Symphony, Massive Forces. Um, we did an opera, a very famous opera called La Traviata by Giuseppe Verdi two months ago which only called for a 15-piece orchestra. It had six or seven soloists, but this was a much more chamber-like presentation. So it, depending on the, the pieces we pick, the programs that we do, um, it can be big or, or, or relatively uh, uh, small. This next question, I'm sure you could probably answer it in, in a half hour. I always, you know, when you see the, you stand up there and you uh, wave your, what are those you're waving? A baton. A baton, okay. <laughs> And what is your role? They're watching you yeah, and, and you're like... That's a great question. Um, it's very evident, um, the role of an instrumentalist in, a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a, 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 an instrumental concert. You can hear the sound of a violin uh, or an oboe or a trumpet. But of course, a conductor makes no sound at all. He's, mm. He or she simply... Um, moves their hand and their arms um, showing certain gestures. So our roles are twofold. One, we are a traffic cop. Um, a very functional, very practical um, facilitator to help um, the people in the ensemble play together. If you remember me saying a couple of minutes ago, you can have an ensemble of 60, 70, 80 people. And the distance between a violinist sitting at the back of that section and the trombonist sitting at the other end of the stage with his group might be 20, 30, 40 yards. Uh, not only can they not hear each other, they sometimes can't even see each other. So you need a coordinator right in the middle of the ensemble to create, um, to create space in time, if you like. And we do that by creating a beat. But the beat is not a sound, like a clap. It's a, it's a, physical, it's a, it's a visual gesture with a movement of the arm which has an accent to it. And I'm doing it now, and I know your listeners can't <laughs> yeah. uh, see it. They, they can imagine but, it. They but can if you feel imagine it, me like throwing it. a dart, and the moment the dart releases from my hand, that is called the beat. or in, we, The technical word is an ictus, a click if you like. So if, if your uh, 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 listeners can just hold up their arm, imagine I'll they're holding a, a dart and go, Choo -choo. and that moment it leaves, that's the beat. And I repeat that action, slow to create a, a slow pulse, or faster to create a fast pulse. And everyone in the ensemble, they see that. And that is their metronome, if you like. So I'm a metronome, uh, a traffic cop again. <laughs> 
coordinating everyone's movements. Um, the other equally important role I play is one of interpreter. Because remember, music without is both a creative process and a recreative process. Without the recreators, music's, music is simply dots and lines on a page. You need a recreator, an interpreter, a musician to take that paper and make a sound from it or galvanize an orchestra to bring this what's on a piece of paper alive. And that is uh, the interpretive role that a conductor plays. So because there's so many people in an orchestra, it can't be done by committee because it'll never be done. Right. You can't ask each of the 50, 60, 70 people in the ensemble, how would you like this piece to go? The day would never end. So you need, it's uh, unfortunately, well, fortunately or unfortunately, a conductor and an orchestra, it's, it's a kind of a benevolent dictatorship whereby the conductor takes the primary role of picking the tempo, shaping it loud, soft, directing it, if you like, conducting it. Um, and, and, and that's my role. And the orchestra's responsibility is to give their best, play their instruments to their best ability, but follow essentially where the conductor is taking them interpretively. So that's my other role. Um, and that is like driving the most fantastic car, sports car or Rolls Royce or whatever analogy you like to do. That's like driving a magnificent machine or a spaceship or a ship or whatever. It's a magnificent feeling. So that, that's, like, oh. that is the addictive thing about conducting. And so, I'm, all conductors will say the same. So you're, you're actually going places. You're not just like standing there, your mind and your body. Oh, absolutely. Well, you, indeed you go places. I mean, the architecture of a piece of music is you start in one place and it takes you through the whole gamut of emotions um, and places. You know, art in many ways is a, is a reflection of one's personal experiences. Uh, both can be both emotional and practical uh, and realistic. Um, and so indeed a master symphony uh, takes you all over the place and for example this Mahler symphony that we're, we're performing it lasts 50 minutes five oh minutes in four big movements and so my goodness by the end of the the symphony you have you have traveled the world of, of, <laughs> of, ex, of emotions and expressions and and experiences uh, that, that can be uh, uh, drawn out of one's soul if you like you, you, the, the soul of the audience and also the musicians, everybody involved. The soul right? of the audience, the soul of the musicians, and the soul of the composer. <laughs> you know, this, this, this composer spent a year writing this piece. Um, and so you can imagine it's a magnificent testimony of what he wants to, to express. And the structure of a, 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 a symphony is, is its architecture in time. So for it not to sound just arbitrary, it has very important structural moments, um, uh, which are uh, you know, built upon um, uh, material and also built upon developing climaxes and then release and then um, building up tensions. And um, again, it's a, it's, a, it's a magnificent landscape of mountains, of plains, of uh, tension of uh, calm um, these are elements of the architecture of a piece of music uh, that that's fascinating I think the listeners will be very uh, they'll be excited to, to go to, a, to the concert and see and experience that for themselves I, I, I hope they will um, the, not only do we play um, pieces of music whether it be the Tchaikovsky Rococo variations or the Mahler Symphony or the La Traviata that we performed last month, or uh, the Tchaikovsky symphonies that we did at the beginning of the year, or Gershwin's um, American in Paris that we opened our season with, or Bernstein's West Side Story, which we will play at the opening of our next season, October, the weekend of October 7th. Um, this is firstly magnificent material, 
But secondly, the New Jersey Festival Orchestra is famed for its professionalism and high quality uh, and dynamic way that it interprets this music. And um, we've been praised in the New York Times for our, our, our professionalism, our excellence. We've been sung, um, our praises have been sung by the New Jersey um, uh, a Star Ledger saying that we're the leading freelance orchestra in the state uh, and um, it's it's amazing that this community has such a, a, a reputable professional organization. Well th this has definitely given me a, a different and a really good perspective on the, the orchestra and I definitely 100% plan on attending um, and, and experiencing all this for myself. Well, I hope I hope you do, Mike, and I hope the whole community galvanizes around this treasure. Um, uh, to a certain, to an extent, uh, a certain extent, uh, undiscovered jewel in the crown of uh, not only Westfield but New Jersey's uh, cultural community. I would say there's one other thing I'd like to briefly talk about, if we have time. Um, we have a very visual and high-profile element to our organization which is the concerts and and um uh, whether it be in 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 union county in in westfield or whether it be in the morris county area uh, hundreds and thatched in fact thousands of people see us but there is another very important element of what we do which i think is quite close to your heart hearing a little about this the wonderful work you do with special needs children we have a very uh, what, what we think is a visionary um outreach and education program where we go into schools um, both schools in our community but also underserved communities we have a residency at Newark Arts High um, whereby we, we give lessons to kids who otherwise would never be exposed to the kind of uh, uh, instrumental uh, 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 instruction that we, we provide we also have what's a program called listening is healing whereby we take our natural resources, our musicians, and we go into unorthodox um, venues such as hospitals, special care facilities. We're at the JFK Special Needs School, which serves seriously physically and mentally handicapped kids and kids with autism. We are, um, and we give concerts there and we work with the kids. We are also, uh, we on a regular basis provide musicians um, up at uh, Morristown Memorial um, Hospital, specifically the Simon Five Cancer Ward, where we partner with the music therapists, the doctors and the nurses there, providing music to be part of both the rehabilitative and sometimes the palliative care process for people at the hospital. We are in collaboration with Children's Specialized Hospital, hospital in June of this year we'll go down and take a, a small 10 12 piece ensemble and give a children's concert on site in New Brunswick in their major facility there we do that also we have done that here in Mountainside with the children's specialized hospital there so again uh, and we have all sorts of different um, activities uh, uh, similar to that where our tentacles are all over the state uh, again, that's under the auspices of what we call listening is healing. So we believe that we have a relevance within our community beyond just being an entertainment uh, or championing the fine arts, but we're using our resources to uh, for a broad scope of experiences to be integrally, in, in, fully integrated into the communities that we serve. And there's one other thing that I know you do with the community. It's the, it, there's an upcoming tour of notable homes in Westfield. Yes. Well, that, of course, all this, Mike, you might imagine, <laughs> takes a lot of money. So one of the biggest and most important engines, if you like, um, of our organization is the fundraising element, the fundraising engine. And that goes on all the time through um, uh, solicitation of individuals, through dialogue with foundations, we get important support from the state, the New Jersey State Council of the Arts, um, and we, of course, we also do um, through the help of this wonderful organisation, which belongs to our the symphony called the New Jersey, the, the Friends of the New Jersey Festival Orchestra, and they organise what's called the annual uh, tour 
of notable homes. It's by far the most famous of all the tours mm -hmm. in Westfield. It's been going on for a good 30 years. And it takes place this year on May, Saturday, May the 13th. And you can get tickets either online from the New Jersey Festival Orchestra website, which is the uh, njfestivalorchestra.org, or you can call our office um, or walk into our office. Um, and the number for our office is 908 232-9400. The address of our office is 224 East Broad Street in Westfield. That's right downtown next to the guillotine uh, haircut place <laughs> uh, or above um, uh, Subway or right across from Starbucks, whatever reference you want to uh, use. Um, and this tour of notable homes, many of uh, your listeners probably will know about it, some might not. Of course, we identify four or five magnificent homes in the Westfield or the area, in Westfield or the, the surrounding areas, uh, and their owners very generously open up uh, their homes for people to come and look um, at, and they are certainly worth uh, looking at. And of course, all the proceeds uh, um, of the ticket sales goes towards uh, specifically supporting our outreach and education uh, activities and our main series concerts. Well, you know, th this has been very interesting. I would like to talk more about Don Rickles. And <laughs> <laughs> I'm afraid some of the jokes he tells, uh, uh, we, we couldn't put them on uh, yeah. a family-based yeah. uh, podcast such as yours, but <laughs> he's a lot of fun. <laughs> and also talk more about our, our tennis and, you know, my lacrosse training with my daughters. Mm. But uh, I think our time is, uh, is is coming to an end, and hopefully we can we'd do this again. But I really appreciate having you on the show. Thank you very much, David. Thank you, Mike. It's been a pleasure to talk, and I wish you and your listeners all the best for this coming summer. Thank you very much.